Um, so uh, this this Rooney workshop is about README tips, um, and this is a topic that really appeals to me uh, because I am constantly excited about all the neat projects that everyone is doing and sharing on GitHub. And sometimes it's a little hard to figure out if it's uh, if it's something that I want to engage in with more deeply or that I want to contribute to, for instance. Um, and so this uh, is intended to be a very, very short entryway into thinking about how to structure your README uh, to make your project more accessible. Um, and I want focusing just on the README and just on specific aspects of the README, uh, because that is really like, you know, the first landing page of your GitHub project. Okay, uh, so keeping track of the time, I want to make sure we have time to get to everything. So I'm going to skip over the verbal introductions and jump straight into my slides. So let's make sure my screen sharing works. Okay, uh, so I have some slides uh, to kind of go over some background material. Uh, they are linked to uh, down below in the slides and notes section in the Google Doc. Uh, so yes, uh, read me tips. You have a project on GitHub. Congrats. Uh, you're already like well on your way there to getting other people to use it. And I think the primary question is, how do you get people to engage with your project? Um, and this is really a very open-ended question. It's complex. There are a lot of facets to it. So I'm going to focus on some very specific versions of this topic of engagement. Um, and so these are some guiding questions for thinking about how you get other people to engage with your project on GitHub. Uh, so things like, what problem does your project solve? Who is your project for? How does a user install it and start using it? And then where would someone go if they wanted to find more detailed information than exists in your README? Um, and so this is, these are all kind of, you know, I think good guiding questions to think about as you decide what kind of content goes in your README. And so this, uh, this lesson assumes you are already familiar with GitHub projects, that you have projects on GitHub, that you have some experience writing in Markdown. Um, so we're not going to go through uh, either of those two. And hopefully by the end of this workshop, uh, you'll be able to have some general ideas about the different types of technical documentation, um, how to create user personas to aid in your design, uh, and then some you know, I'm going I'm to have some templates for uh, simple readmes that you can use uh, in your projects. So I'm going to start with talking about documentation types. Um, and starting with, uh, if you have not seen this talk before, I recommend checking it out. Um, Danielle Proshida talks about the kind of four kinds of technical documentation um, with very different purposes and different approaches. Um, and I think this is at least useful to uh, classify and think about how your documentation exists. Uh, and so these are uh, these four. So tutorials, uh, so long form tutorials on using on uh, doing a project, how to guides, so very simple recipes for solving specific problems, explanation, so you know discussion of you know, the context of the project and kind of why it exists and what it's uh, intended to do. And then reference. So for your software projects, you know, the like technical documentation on the functions and its arguments. And so these are different kinds of documentation and something that is suitable if someone is using the software and trying to remember or trying to figure out what a specific function argument is, that's going to be very different than the kind of documentation you want to put in a readme to get people into your project and using it quickly. Uh, so we're gonna focus uh, just on the how-to guide uh, for your README. All right, uh, cool. Actually went through that a little bit quickly. 
Uh, so I'm going to jump into uh, talking about user personas. Um, so I'll do a quick check. Uh, if you are familiar with this concept or this term, uh, if you're if you can use the nonverbal zoom features to put a thumbs up or type a, a Y in the chat. Okay, great. Uh, so some of you are familiar with this already uh, and, and some of you are not, so this will be new. Um, all right, user personas are an exercise to think about uh, who your users are. Um, they're not intended to be fully exhaustive uh, in the sense that you're not trying to, uh, trying to capture all the possible users but really focusing on some very specific use cases and using specific details when you construct a user persona um, to guide the design of your project. So these are descriptions. Personas are descriptions of imaginary users. And a good persona will include things like the background knowledge and experience uh, for uh, who is using your project, what their motivations and needs are, um, and then some of the concerns and barriers. So what are the limitations that they might have that your project either is solving or you need to be concerned about because that prevents someone from engaging with your project. Uh, so here's an example that uh, I wrote for some of the work that I do. So I focus on um, reproducibility and open science teaching. Um, so this example is uh, River is a PhD student in biology. River's previous research experience is in a non-computational wet lab. So they have taken the standard math courses for biology majors, including a basic stats class. So get some of that knowledge and basic experience. What they want to do, uh, they want to digitize their data for statistical analyses and to share for other people to use. Uh, River is also curious about using other people's data for meta-analyses. So this kind of guides you into what specific problem they might want to solve, as well as some of their motivations for, uh, for further learning, so further pathways to uh, more engagement than maybe just what is in the README. And then some of the, the obstacles, reverse using physical logbooks in their current project. Uh, so there's going to be a digitization component to deal with. Uh, River has previously struggled to use Excel in a stats class uh, and is also worried because they've been hearing a lot of news about how spreadsheets are dangerous, um, how you, if you use them, they may alter your data or introduce errors. Uh, and so that's a concern to address uh, for you know, the kind of teaching project that I'm interested in about data management. All right, so I'm going to Stop screen sharing um, and go share this link. Um, so I have, a, I have an exercise uh, for you all to work on uh, a user persona for your project or an imaginary project. Um, if you would like to do, let me copy that. All right, uh, so if you click on the link uh, in the chat or from the Google Doc, that will take you to a HackMD template. Um, and uh, I've made this uh, non-editable uh, to force you to create a copy of it <laughs> to work on rather than all working in the same document. Um, so yeah, copy it, paste it into a new document and I'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, just type out, um, you know, an example user persona for uh, for your current project uh, or one of your current projects, um, and then uh, check in after a few minutes uh, and uh, see if uh, anyone is willing to share what they have. Uh, and in the meantime, I will I'll take any questions. Um, the moment for recording purposes. Okay, uh, yeah. Let me do, do, do. Okay. 
Uh, yep, so here is the template. Uh, if you're in HackMD, uh, you can create a new note and then uh, copy and paste all of this into a new, a new Markdown document. I did try and look into uh, into creating templates for other people to use on HackMD, but I don't think that's a feature that exists yet. You can only create templates for yourself to use. All right, so we'll give uh, maybe 30 more seconds. And then uh, I will ask if anyone is willing to share. Okay, time's up. Uh, I know that was really fast, uh, and I apologize for the for the for the time limit. But this is a very short session, uh, so yes. Even if it's not complete, uh, if you are willing to share, please go ahead and um, uh, yeah, raise a hand or or unmute yourself um, and uh, share what you have. Are participants able to share a screen? Okay, yeah, and you can share a screen if you would like. And if not, I will start calling names. Uh, <laughs> Dominic? Do you have an example to share? Or you don't have to if you don't want to. I actually didn't have one to share. I was still thinking about it and then the time was over, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No worries. Uh, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Benjamin. So I, I, I got about halfway through the name. Well, the first bit, I got their name <laughs> and I got the rest. It was a bit too quick for me, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, actually, I saw, I saw Warwick unmute. Uh, so Warwick, do you, do you want to share? Uh, yeah, I won't share my screen, but I, <laughs> I don't know. And I, I feel like I'm possibly vaguely prepared enough that I could say what I was going for, because I, I think I probably spent about a quarter of the time generating the random name. Um, uh, but anyway, so the, the package I'm thinking of um, is basically a, a library of tools for just reading and operating with some standard formats that we have in our particular niche of astronomy. Um, and so what I thought of was a person whose name is apparently Giobe, I guess, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't actually know. Um, who might be a PhD student who is about to start writing their PhD thesis and they want to make beautiful plots of some of the data um, that they've generated with, with one of the, the programs we use. Um, so yeah, this has, I, I, I guess I got sparked by this by seeing the prompts for like, you know, greater aspirational goals, you know, because like short-term goal is finish a PhD, medium-term get a postdoc and long-term, you know, revolutionize science and so on. Um, their concerns and barriers might be that if it's their PhD thesis, they probably want, or well, they might want the plots to look very specifically the way they want them to. Um, so from my perspective, um, although I get, I hope my libraries already do that, you want to be able to work with the data in such ways you can still, you know, you're not prescribing things um, in a way that would prevent them from doing so. Um, and they may also have tight time limitations, depending on how well or, or badly prepared they are for actually writing up and how much new stuff they need to generate compared to how much they may have already put in papers on the way to producing their PhD thesis. Cool, thank you for sharing. All right, uh, so I'm gonna move on to the next section, which is talking about structuring your readme and focusing on how to get into the, the how-to guide, ideally. Okay, 
so I stole I stole this content from from David Robinson's blog post, and uh, this is focused about uh, actually teaching students to use uh, to use um, data science uh, tools in R. Um, and the idea is to get users doing powerful things quickly. Um, and I think that is uh, an ideal way to structure your readme uh, is having a demonstration of after installing the software or installing or you know getting the project uh, you know usable, doing something really neat with it. Um, and this is where that that distinction between the types of documentation is really important because I think uh, oftentimes as the creators of a project or the creators of a software, we're really we're really interested in explaining things. We're really interested in explaining like why we use this particular data structure or why we use this particular algorithm. Uh, but that is an explanation that gets in the way of action. It gets in the way of getting our users doing something really neat, really quickly. And then once we get that, oh, I think once we get users doing that, then uh, we have their interest and they know that they can do it uh, and that lowers the barrier to uh, you know, using the rest of the features of your, of your project. Okay, so here's some examples, right? So yeah, uh, as, as Work mentioned, doing some really interesting and neat visualizations with the data uh, or analyses or whatever your project is intended to do. How? Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. No. <laughs> I forgot, I stopped it, okay. Okay, yes. Uh, getting users doing powerful things quickly. Luckily, we just had the one slide. <laughs> um, and so I think in structuring, uh, you know, the how to guide in your readme, um, there are really just a couple main sections, right? In your readme, you know, introduction to your project, uh, your how to guide for doing whatever awesome thing it is uh, you want to use as an example. Um, and then your pathway to further usage or engagement. Um, so that will be things like, uh, you know, the full tutorial that you've developed, uh, maybe a guide to how people can contribute to your project and your code of conduct. Um, and then the license and acknowledgement section um, for citing your software uh, and acknowledging your funding sources and things like that. Okay, so I have an example that I wanna share for, uh, I really like, um, this is from uh, the data pasta package in R. I have to admit, I saw this a few years ago and I've never actually used it, but the how-to guide was done so well that I just always remember it. And you can see just at the top of the readme, there is this animated GIF that shows you what the software is all about. And what it is, is, uh, it's on a short loop. It's copying and pasting uh, this table of numbers from a website and then being able to paste it in code in a nice formatted data structure. And just seeing this on a loop, I immediately get a sense of this is a really cool thing that I can do using this software. And I don't even, you know, I haven't even gotten to all the, all the details about actually getting it to work. But just seeing this animation at the top, uh, you know, I I have a sense for what it is about and how it might be useful to me. And I remember this uh, years on, never having actually used the software. I remember that this is what this project is about. And now I'm sharing this example of reading me with you. Okay, so I also have a a, a templated readme, uh, but I think uh, rather than trying to fill all of it out, uh, I will ask you just to focus on the section that is the how-to guide. So what is the example task that you might, uh, you might ask your users to do? Um, so I'll post it in the, I'll post the link to the, in the chat. But really, I just want you to think about, uh, for the sake of time, what the example task is that you're going to use to demonstrate what your project is about. Um, 
I think about that, uh, maybe write it down, uh, and then we'll I'll ask for more volunteers to share that. And this time I will not stop screen sharing uh, so that I won't forget. <laughs> Give you 30 more seconds. To think about your example task. Um, and also, you know, anything that would be required to do your example task. So if it's something like uh, doing something with a data set, you know, making sure that you either have an example data set provided with your project or you have code to you know, download an example data set from somewhere to use with it. Okay, uh, is anyone willing to, to share what example task they came up with? And if not, I will start calling on some different names. Uh, I see Esther, Esther next up. Oh no, I'm just like looking over the readme file and really admiring your template. I really like it, but yeah, I don't have anything to add other than your readme file. Apologies. Okay, uh, Laura, do you have something you're willing to share? Um, yeah, so my project, which is in its very, very early stages, an aspect of it is going to be um, collaborating on a I guess like a library or a set of references um, and so the example task I think would be to have somebody add to that library and then see whatever they've added appear. Yeah, I think that's that would that's a great example. Um, you know, if it's anything that involves a contribution and then seeing someone's contribution with everything else. Uh, that's a really, I think, empowering task. Uh, that can draw people in. Uh, so thank you, thank you for sharing. All right, uh, so I will move on to kind of concluding thoughts, um, leaving space for some questions and then, uh, you know, making sure I think all the links and resources that I've created are available in the Google Doc notes. Okay, so some takeaways. Uh, so we have one more slide. Uh, so first, uh, knowing your users and what they need, uh, and so using that user persona exercise to kind of guide you into thinking about that. Um, two is to get your users doing powerful things quickly, uh, making sure that that is a prominent section of your readme um, and near the top to get people in. And then third is to, of course, watch out for jargon that you don't define. Um, so here's a, here's a clip from the Schitt's Creek TV show about uh, the complications in cooking recipes and what it means to fold in the cheese. Um, so I'll leave this with you. Uh, I'll leave this slide up and uh, just see if you all have questions. You have one in the chat. Yes. Can we cite your example readme template? Yes, uh, you can cite all of this. Um, where, 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 where did I put it? Uh, in the other informations, other information and links section of the Google Docs, there is a link to the materials website, um, which has the slides, the templates, uh, a link to outside resources, um, and uh, this is a 
all CC BY material uh, and the DOI link will take you to the latest, uh, latest version on Zenodo. Fantastic, thanks so much. Uh, so what what is your thought on badges? Um, because I when I look at projects, uh, they have an average of three to twenty badges, and I always feel like there's an optimum somewhere in the middle, and something are better or worse suited to be a badge. So yeah. so do you, do you have any thoughts on this? I, yeah, I mean, I think I think badges are, are useful for a very specific audience. I think they're useful for signaling to, uh, you know, maybe primarily other developers in the open source community that you have, that you're meeting certain standards, whether they're things like uh, automated testing or, um, you know, uh, a specific specification or, uh, you know, a DOI. Um, I, you know, I, I definitely think there's, yeah, it can be, it can be, it can be easy to, it can be easy to have too many badges because, um, you know, we're like, we're like all chasing metrics and we're all, we're, and you know, it, it feels like, you know, we've gamified everything. Um, uh, and so, yeah, again, I think that that goes back to like your user persona. So maybe, you know, you can have more than one user persona, right? You can have a user persona for someone who is a user for your project, but maybe also a different user persona for a contributor to your project. And so thinking about what are the relevant badges for the contributors, what do they care about before they decide to, you know, um, you know, file a bug request or submit a pull request or things like that. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that can be relevant there to decide on the badges. All right, sure. so we're, we're at 1120 or yeah. I guess 1620, depending on your time zone. Uh, thank you all for, for coming to the session. Um, yeah, feel free to, yeah, again, use any of the resources, cite any of it that you want. Um, you know, poke me on Slack or social media for uh, anything related to this topic or other things. Uh, and yeah, again, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you very much, Hao. Um, if people want to, um click on the link there, then that'll take you back to the to the main meeting room. And then once again, thank you. I will do a virtual clapping. <laughs>